All right, good afternoon. So here we are yet again for another lovely session of ENGR 2302 Engineering Dynamics. This is going to be the third lecture in the series, and we'll have a part one and part two with this one as well. It is um, February 21st, 2017, and here we are for Engineering Dynamics yet again. Today we're going to work on finishing up on um, motion of, well, I shouldn't say motion, I should say kinematics of particles, um, but in particular we're going to work on the kinematics of several objects joined together, and also we'll look at rotational kinematics a bit, um, and as compared to last time where we only looked at linear kinematics. As a reminder, kinematics is describing the motion of particles ignoring things like forces and masses, looking only at only uh, looking only at describing the motion of those bodies. Okay, so let's let's work through uh, another example or two, and then look at curvilinear motion. All right, so let's look at this. I'm going to describe a system here, and let's look here. So I'm going to have a couple, a system of pulleys again. This one a little more complex. And let's see. So I'm going to describe this here. So this is given. Let me just draw this out. I'm going to have a rod, two rods, and a collar. Well, two rods and some colors on them with pulleys, and well, you'll see, it's going to be a little bit convoluted. This is going to be one of those really fun problems with lots of pulleys put together. So what I'm drawing here is a vertical rod, and this is going to be a rod that a collar with a pulley on it, or actually simply a collar, will be able to ride up and down on. And I'll have another one here. So I have a vertical rod of constant diameter, low, zero friction, et cetera, et cetera. And then let's say I have, let me draw a collar on here with a bracket that we can attach a cord to. Then there'll be a fixed pulley here. Fixed pulley, actually let me draw it a bit more. I probably should have put this a little bit further over, but that's okay. We can make it work. So I'll have a pulley here, like this, and yeah, actually I might want to move this one a little bit over. And then another uh, rod here. Here to here. And then a collar on this one that will be able to slide up and down. So on here, the, on the rods, these green collars, these are just something that can ride up and down on the, um, on the rod, on the pole. Like shown here. And riding up and down on this one is going to be a pulley. So there's a pulley here, a pulley here. A just attachment point here, but oh, this one can slide up and down. Um, let's see, so there's that, and then there'll be one final pulley right here. One final pulley here, and then a cord that goes between all of these. So there's a cord that goes down, up, and around, down, up, and around, along this pulley, and then down this pulley. And then there'll be a mass hanging here. And assume all of these are hanging perfectly vertically. I know I didn't, I drew this one especially a little slanted, but I want all of these to be vertical from another one, from each other. And this will be the actual weight that is driving the system. So let me label some points then. So I have a big weight hanging here. So this is a rod that a, a collar on a, a, a collar on a rod that can move up and down, a collar a, a pulley on a collar on a rod that can move up and down, two fixed pulleys and a weight. Lovely. Then let me label some points. I'm going to describe this as point A. 
B, uh, C here, this would be point C, D, and E. D and E. Okay. And then I have two points, uh, K and L. They are points in space, not objects. So I'm going to have point K, which is up here, and point L, which is down here. And the distance between them is 8 inches. All right. So let's see. Other, other things. So let's say I have this. Um, other things that are known. Given pulley D is attached to a collar which moves downward at three inches per second. Is pulled downward at three inches per second. So three inches per second. And then let's see what else. At t equals zero, um, at t equals zero, a starts moving down from k. Moves down from k um, with constant acceleration and zero initial velocity. With a is constant and v naught equals zero. Okay, and then also, I'll also tell us that um, collar A's velocity, collar A's velocity at, um, is, I should say, is 12 inches per second when it passes L. When it passes L, when it passes L. And then finally, so all this is, this is what we're given. We're told that pulley D is pulled downward at three inches per second. And then at time T equals zero, A moves downward from K um, with, with A, with basically the acceleration being constant. We're not told the value is, we're just told that it's a constant acceleration. And, um, and we're also told that the uh, initial velocity of A is zero. So basically, this one's moving down, this one is moving down, and then there's a weight, which is just sort of going for a ride, I should say. I, I, I erroneously said earlier this one was moving the whole thing. It's actually that these two are being pulled down, and then this one is just sort of going for a ride. And then I want to find, from all of this, what I wish to find is, um, I want to determine the change in elevation. Uh, change in elevation. change in elevation, velocity, and acceleration, and acceleration of block B when uh, block A is at L. Okay. So again, A is going to go from K to L. A is actually going to accelerate. Um, D is going to be moving downward, but it's going to be moving downward at a constant velocity. And so these two, these two pulleys here and here, pulley C and pulley E, these are fixed. They're not going anywhere. They're glued to the ceiling or welded to the ceiling or whatnot. So they're not going anywhere. And then based on how this one and this one moves, B will move in some relation. So what a mess. We have all these pulleys moving around. We have uh, we have three different pulleys, um, two collars, a weight. All this stuff is flying all over the place, and we got to figure out how object B or how weight B moves through space. Isn't that lovely? Whew. All right, let's do that. So um, I have a list of steps that I'm going to go through. The first thing I'm going to do is I if I, I give you a general layout, um, and, I'll, and I will repeat these as I go through them. Um, generally, first I'm going to define the origin as the um, upper horizontal surface. So I'm going, to, I'm going to let my zero height be here with a positive displacement downward. 
And then I'm gonna say that collar AA has a, a uniform accel acceleration rectilinear motion. In other words, it's moving in a straight line, but at a constant acceleration, that makes sense. And for this, I will solve for the acceleration um, and time T needed to reach L. Then I will say that column that, that uh, pulley D is moving at a constant velocity. In other words, it has a uniform rectilinear motion. And I'll calculate the change in position at time t. And then block, I'll say block B is dependent on the motions of A and D. And I will write some relationships between them, to, and then I'll work through all of the um, math from there. Simple, right? <laughs> Easy peasy. Don't worry, I'll not go through that so, va so fast. Um, let's actually break this down and look at a series of steps. OK. So again, I will define the origin. So let's work through the solution. The first step isn't going to actually wor involve working anything out. I just say, um, actually, I'm gonna put, I like to put actually solution here. One, set the upper ceiling. Well, that's not how you spell ceiling. Um, ceiling as the origin and downward as positive. And the reason I did this is because all of these things are moving downward. If I look at this, um, here, actually, sorry, uh, these two are moving downward. B is going to move upward. So I'm going to have more things moving downward than upward. So I might as well just give A and B, or A and D, a positive velocity. Um, then I'm going to assume that, um, assume collar A. A has positive uniform acceleration rectilinear motion. So what I mean by this is, and I want to solve for, what I want to do is, I want to solve um, for acceleration A and time t to reach L at the given velocity. So here, well, let's consider this. I'm going to use the equation v final squared equals v naught squared. This is just a um, level of equation from high school math, or from high school physics. So vf squared equals v naught squared plus 2a delta x. And again, this equation can be used when only when you have constant acceleration. This is an equation of motion for constant acceleration. All right, so then I can say, um, let me set this up for actually, this is just a generic equation. Let me sub, set this up for particle A, for collar A. So I will say VA squared, maybe VA final squared, equals VA naught squared plus 2AA. Um, actually, let me be consistent and use like a capital A here and a capital A here times um, xa final minus xa initial. So basically this is change in the position of x. So this would be the acceleration of a, this would be the initial velocity of a, the final velocity of a, the initial position of a, and the final position of a. Now, I don't actually know the overall position of each of these. However, I do know that the, I do know the difference in position between each of these. So in other words, I don't know how far it is from here to here, but I do know that the difference between the initial and the final is going to be 8 inches. Um, let's see, what else do I know? Well, I know that the initial velocity of A is 0, so I can just, I can just make that go away. 
then I can say, all right, I can plug in values for my, um, if I mention here, caller A's velocity is 12 inches per second when it passes L. So that's going to be what this is. So 12 inches per second, 12 inches per second squared is equal to 2 a, um, sub A times 8 inches. And if you solve through this, this leads to that AA is equal to 9 inches per second squared. The acceleration of A is going to be 9 inches per second per second. Every second, it will accelerate by 9 inches per second. So that's one value we'll need. VA then, or the final acceleration of A, or sorry, final velocity of A, VA final is going to be equal to VA initial plus AA times T. And what I'm looking for is T. So T is going to be equal to then VA final minus VA initial over the acceleration. So in other words, 12 inches per second minus 3 inches per second uh, minus, I should say actually minus 0 over 9 inches per second squared. And this comes to 1.333 seconds, one and a third seconds. So this isn't my final result, but I have determined something useful. I have now solved, I, I have now completely solved for the motion of collar A. I now know how long it takes it to re go from K to L, and I also know how, uh, I know the acceleration required to produce that motion. Any questions on how I did that? Again, just a fairly straightforward uh, application of uh, high school physics, essentially. All right, next, I want to look at rectilinear motion. I want to look at rectilinear motion. Or, oh, sorry, I want to look at rectilinear motion of particle D, or a pulley D. Okay, so the next step, I guess this is step labeled three, I should say. Three. Again, pulley D has uniform rectilinear motion. And then I, will, I want to calculate the um, change in position in time T. And this is why it was crucial that we solve for the time T earlier. So the, the time we saw for earlier, these are all joined together. And so I asked, if, you, if I go back to the original prompt, it says, determine change in elevation, velocity, and acceleration of block B when A is at L. I found the time it takes to go from, uh, from K to L for, for collar A here. And so that's going to be the determining time for my entire system. So in other words, I'm going to be looking at what kind of motion um, D undergoes in that time T, and I'm going to be looking at the kind of motion that B undergoes in that time T. All of these are related. All of these are going to be have the same time between them. Time is what's going to connect all of these things together. Also, the cord will connect them together, but that's a different thing. Also, the force will connect them together. Oh, no, never mind. We're, we're not there yet. We're at, no, no, okay. Force joke. Um, I'm so sorry. No, I'm not. Um, anyway, uh, good. So, call, uh, so pulley D has uniform rectilinear motion. Calculate change in position at time t of pulley D in time t. So I know that. Basically, the position of block D, or pulley D, at time T is going to be equal to the initial position, XD um, initial, plus the velocity D times T. And then, um, I don't know the initial position, but I can find the change in position. So basically, XD equal minus XDO 
is going to be equal to um, VDT or 3 inches per second times 1.33 seconds. And this is going to be a change of 4 inches. So in those 1.33 seconds, block a D or pulley D, however you want to describe it, is going to move down a total of 4 inches. Okay then. Step four, I can realize that um, block B is the motion of block B. Block B's motion is dependent on um, motions of A and D. A and D. And so I want to relate, write an equation of motion to relate them. Write motion equation to relate them. So what I'm going to say is um, something like this uh, to relate them. So um, block B motion is dependent on pulley D, uh, ND, and write motion relationship and solve for the change of uh, block P in, in position in time T. Then solve for change in position of block B. Okay. So. Um, Here's the question. How do I handle this? I have a, I could try to think through it and I could try to say, okay, if this one's moving twice as much and this one's doing this and this one's doing that, but there's actually a very simple way, a much simpler way. I could try to say, oh, this one's moving twice and there's two lengths and all this kind of stuff. Or I could simply say, you know what? This is the same chord. This is the same chord. So what that means is it means that the total length of the chord is going to remain unchanged. So what I'm going to do is I am going to set up a relationship um, between the initial and final uh, lengths of each, um, between the initial and final lengths of uh, the chord, or actually the initial and final positions, and I can say that the initial and final lengths are the same. So maybe something like this, xa final plus 2xa final or sorry, 2xb final, or sorry, 2xd final, plus um, xb final is equal to xa initial plus 2xd initial plus xb initial. So if you look here, uh, sorry to jump around so much. The total length of this chord is going to be xa plus xd times 2 plus xb. From here to here is xb, from here to here is xd, and from here to here is xa. And all of these are going to be changing, right? I'm going to have an initial and a final state for each of these. However, the total sum must remain unchanged. The, the chord isn't going to get any longer or shorter. So that's what this relationship is. This is saying that I have a, oh, actually, let me do it in a different color, maybe purple. I'm saying that I have an initial length here, or actually a final length, final total length is equal to the final initial length. Or sorry, uh, initial uh, total length. Then what I can do is to say, I can group these together, because I don't actually have the initial position values again. What I have is the deltas. So what I can say then is, if I bring, um, if I know that x final minus x initial is just delta x, right? Is delta x. I can basically say, if I bring this one over here and say a, a final minus a initial is just delta x, I can say that delta x1, I can say that delta x a plus delta x b, or sorry, delta x d, let me back up, 
delta xa plus 2 delta xd plus delta xb is equal to 0. And then I can say that xb, delta xb, is equal to, uh, fairly simply, negative, if I put, put in values, um, actually not yet, delta xa minus 2 delta xd. So basically I put, uh, I brought this over to the other side, and now I can simply plug in values to find the change in x of um, block b. So delta xb again is uh, simply uh, delta xa, negative delta xa minus 2 delta xd Oh, delta xa, I should say, right? Um, delta xa. So, yeah, sorry about that. Like that. So then, um, from here, it's just a plug and chug relationship. So this is going to be essentially negative 2 times 4 inches minus uh, 8 inches. Because we remembered xa over here was 8 inches. So this 8 inches here for, for the block a, for the, pulley, for the pulley or the collar a. And d is going to move 4 inches in that time. And so the total is going to be negative 16 inches. And that was actually one of the unknowns we were solving for. That was one of the um, requested solutions for the problem. Equals delta xb. Block B uh, is going to move a total of negative 16 inches. Basically what this means is 16 inches, um, did I really write inches that way? Oh my. Uh, 16 inches upward. Why is it upward? Exactly, because we defined downward as positive. So if I get a negative number, I know that this thing is moving upward because I defined downward as positive. And then, um, let's see. Then let's look at this here. I can then go and say, OK, um, differentiate motion relationship twice to develop equations of motion and velocity for block B. So my final step, I guess this is going to be step five. Uh, differentiate motion relation O here uh, twice to develop equation for velocity and acceleration of block B. velocity and acceleration of block B. Of block B. So I don't like the way they're doing it here. I'd like to actually do a derivative here. And so let's see. Well, let's think about what I know here. I know that the delta, I know the delta x, right? I know the um, block B is going to start from rest, I believe, right? Yes, they're both all starting from rest, I think. No, 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 that one starts at three inches. This is actually a little bit tricky. Okay, so another way we can look at it though, here, is that the same kind of relationship is going to apply. So I'm going to say that just like with the, um, the, the same kind of relationship between uh, position is going to apply for velocity. So VA here 
plus 2VD plus VB is going to be zero. Uh, just because these two these velocities have to add up. These velocities have to add up or combine together to produce something that will work out. All right, so then um, 12 inches per second. 12 inches per second plus 2 times 3 inches per second plus v is e vb is equal to 0 and then vb is equal to 18 inches per second. vb is 18 inches per second during at the end of that um, period and then um, I can say here so that's going to be our second quant desired quantity. And the accelerations will also have a similar um, relationship. AA plus 2AD plus AB is equal to zero. And then um, this here, well AD we know is zero because it's not accelerating. And then 9 inches per second squared, which we had previously, plus VB equals 0, or sorry, AB equals 0. And therefore, AB is equal to negative 9 inches per second squared. Here, like so. All right. Let's see. I'm trying to figure out if there's any else, anything else I want to explain on that. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, questions on that. All I'm doing is relating the various accelerations, velocities, etc. Okay, I'm just I'm just relating the various accelerations, velocities, and changes in position. All right. Let's see. So maybe I'll look at another one of these. Maybe a final problem for rectilinear motion. Maybe another fun pulley, uh, pulley problem. Here. Okay. So consider something like this. I'm going to have a pulley in kind of a channel, or a pit, you might call it. Why not? I guess I could use that color. So one of these fun multi-pulley problems again. And then something like this. Oh, it's not level. That looks good enough. Then a few pulleys. Draw pulleys, happy pulleys. So a pulley like this here. I have a big block here. And I'm gonna move this over. Then another pulley up here. This one's fixed to the wall, and maybe a there's going to be a little um, attachment point here, and then there'll be a pulley here. There'll be a pulley here, and then another pulley here, and the cord then is going there'll be a block over here. 
the cord will start out on the block, go up around this pulley, down through this pulley, so up around this pulley, if I can get my art right, down and around this pulley, around this pulley, and attach to the block. Then um, I'm going to have labels A and B. I'm going to have block A and block B. And then points C and D. C and D. So um, I'll also be given that slider A Slider A moves to the left with a constant velocity with a constant V equals 6 meters per second. Determine, and so that's given, and then find the velocity of block B. I wish to find the velocity of block B. Okay, so I'm going to start via, um, so basically my steps, solution, and steps. One, um, sketch uh, system and coordinate system. One, sketch coordinate system. and coordinate system. So just D and C are just two points that we'll use for our analysis. Uh, two, write out constraint equations. Write out constraint equations. Write out constraint equations, and then three, uh, differentiate relationship. To get um, velocity. Okay. So let me sketch this out again, um, just uh, with a certain label on it, though. Okay. So what I'm going to have is, I, I'm going to have this again. I don't want to redraw the entire thing, but I'll redraw what needs to be redrawn, I think. I'm going to define this like this here. I have C here. And the, uh, actually, the cord is down here, pulley here, pulley here, attachment point here, cord go. Actually, let me do this in a different color. Pulley, pulley, and pulley. Have my cord that go comes up, down, around, and attaches to the other block. And we define some um, coordinates. So I'm going to have what I call x, a, and y, b. And so a and b. I'm going to let this be x, a. Um, since the block is moving to the left, um, this means this is going to move to the left, and the block is going to be raising or rising. And so this here, I'm going to let be xa. And then I'm going to let this height here, downward, be yb. 
because this is this height up here isn't changing so I'm just gonna leave that the same now um let's see let's consider the total length of the cord let's consider the total length of the cord in ignoring this part up here because that's never going to change xa the horizontal distance to this block plus 3yb uh, plus any constants plus constants equals l okay so I'm kind of doing a dirty derivative here, I know, but this is, um, I'm just trying to get at the, why I can get this differential relationship. So, in other words, if I differentiate these with respect to time, right, if I differentiate this with, with respect to time, what will I get? Say I have um, this, if I take the partial, if I take the derivative of this with respect to time, what do I get? If I do this, I get basically um, uh, 1 and then times dxa over dt, right? Plus 3 times dyb dt, and all of these just go to 0. So when I said I take, the deriv I take the derivative earlier, you may have been a little confused why I was able to do this, but what I'm doing is I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to time. And then uh, just if you remember, um, in part, if you remember um, implicit differentiation, you'll end up with the dxa dt, that kind of thing here. And then, um, so, but, but the constants remain. And then if I take uh, this here, this is, or another way to look at this is dxa dt. That is just the velocity. So va plus 3vb is equal to 0. The change in y with respect to time, that's just the velocity. The um, change in x with respect to time, that's just the velocity a. And so then I can simply say, well, I was told that VA is, three, three, is uh, 6 meters per second. 6 meters per second plus 3BV is equal to 0. And VB is then equal to 2 meters per second. Or VB is equal to 2 meters per second upward. VB is equal to 2 meters per second upward. So it all comes down to laying out a system, finding your constraints. In other words, what values have to be zero? What values do I already know? What values, um, in terms of displacements especially, you often have uh, constraints. If things are joined together, that's where you're really going to have constraints, where, um, where you know that the one length has to be related to another length. These are constraints that are related together. All right, so um, let's see. Questions on that? Uh, negative two, let's see, did I screw that up? Yes, you're right, it should be negative two. You're right, thank you. That should be negative two, but then I can reinterpret to say that this is two meters per second upward. It's going to be, it just turned out negative because whatever, for whatever reason, I decided to define yb as downward positive. But yes, it's going to be um, moving upward. Okay. So let's talk about, let's move on to the next topic. Um, I'm now finished with rectilinear motion, but I would like to talk a bit about graphical solutions. And I'm going to talk about this very briefly. I want to talk about this fairly briefly and see how we can look at the, um, the graphical interpretation of each of these. So um, I think we mentioned this a, bri a, a bit last time, but graphical interpretations, rectilinear motion. I should say, when studying systems, experimental systems, like actually building things and taking measurements, engineers often gather data 
often gather data of just one form of motion. In other words, i.e., just position of velocity or force. All the rest have to be calculated from the others. See, the other two have to be calculated from the first. There are basically two ways. One, you could use a um, algebraic solution. Basically, get the best fit line to your data. Get best fit lines data. All of those things you learn how to do in that fun, lovely class, ENGR 2304. Um, get best fit to data. Anyone in that class right now? Yeah? Okay. We all got out of the way, I guess. Um, algebraic solution, get best fit to data, get best fit to data, and then um, then take derivatives and integrals. Slash integral. Two would be to use a graphical solution. So um, let us look at the um, let's look at the graphical relationships here. Okay, so acceleration or position velocity acceleration graphical relationships, or let me say derivative relationships first or slope relationships. X, V, T, or X, V, A. So if you have a displacement versus time relationship, this is definitely a review from calculus class, but maybe you're asleep in calculus, so let's review. If you have the position versus time function here, and Let's say you had a curve of some, it's just some arbitrary curve. What does the slope of the line give you? The slope of the position versus timeline, what does that give you? Yes, of course, velocity. This is going to give us velocity. So if I take the tangent line or the slope and find the slope of that, this is going to give me here the slope 1 m or I could simply say it will have a slope of the slope at that point this tangent line has a slope of 1 to v the slope essentially is dx dt which is equal to v and then this appears as the height at a certain time so let's say this is at T1. Then if I go to my velocity versus time graph, velocity versus time. Oh, what, why, why did I draw something so complicated? Now I actually have to make them kind of match. Oh boy. Um, let's see. So it's going to be negative slope from Oh, let's see. So it's going to have to do something like this, right? Actually, that's going to have to be a positive. Well, that's still positive. Something kind of like this. Then it bottoms out and 
and this would this point here actually this point here would be this point here again this point here would be this point here where we go from positive or sorry a actually no it would be this point here where we go from positive to negative slope and then this point here would be this point here where we go from a negative to a positive slope and I'll just leave it like that and then, um, so maybe that's not quite about it, I'd have to look at it a bit in more detail, but, so this would be about time t1, but this height would be v at that, at that uh, height level, or at that t level. The height of the graph would be the v. But what would the acceleration of this thing be? I'm sorry, I, I gave that away. Mm. Um, the slope of this line would be the acceleration. So this would have a slope of 1 to a. Or I could say dA dt is going to be equal to dV dt is going to be the acceleration. And then if I looked at the velocity versus time graph, or sorry, the acceleration versus time graph, and I need to take more look at this graph. The, the um, the positive and negative portions of this graph are going to be fine, but the concavity is probably wrong. I didn't look at it closely enough for that. I was drawing, kind of drawing that on the fly. So don't quote me on the concavity of that graph. T and A. And then, if I plot this out, the acceleration, well, every place that the um, velocity is positive, or every place, every, sorry, every place that the velocity is decreasing should have a negative acceleration. And then every place where it's increasing, we should have a positive acceleration. So maybe something kind of like that or something, based on the same time interval there. And then this would be maybe t1, and this would be the actual value, the height there would be equal to the value of a. So um, then, and simply, and the acceleration, the slope of that, well, technically, what is the slope of acceleration? Hmm, have you ever heard that before? What is the rate of change in acceleration? Huh? Did you just call me a jerk? That is rude. Oh, sorry, anyway, no. <laughs> Yes, the technical term is actually called the jerk. Yes, the jerk. Um, also known as your instructor. Oh, sorry. Um, anyway, the uh, technical term for the the term for acceler the change rate of change in acceleration is called the jerk. That that actually is true. We're not making this up. The rate of change in acceleration is the jerk. And what is the rate? There is another one for what is the one for jerk after that? I'm trying to remember the name of it. It's something else. Tug maybe. I don't know. I forget what the rate of change for jerk is. But. Um, we only mainly talk about, I'm sorry, that was a very stupid joke. Um, we only mainly talk about uh, velocity, uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, because those have direct applications to things like forces. Um, the rate of change of acceleration really doesn't have a whole lot of impact in terms of, okay, for example, um, it always bothers me when I see, like, um, uh, say in physics class, uh, it's fairly common for you to see something like this, where they say, okay, well, here is a velocity versus time equation. So um, this bothers me deeply. You'll never actually see a curve like this, but often in elementary physics courses, they use a curve like this because it allows you to work through the area relationships that we'll see momentarily. But Look at this. They'll use, and, and this is meant to be a straight line. I, I know I can't draw a straight, down, straight line to save my life. But say this is velocity and time, and they'll show something like this. Hmm. What's the problem with that? They'll say maybe something like a, a car has the following, the following velocity profile. Very classic problem. And they'll put some numbers on it, whatever. And then um, something like this here. Um, or is it, sorry, this velocity profile? Actually, let me think about that. The No, this, this is not right. Um, let me think about that. It's 
More like position profile, I think. Yes. Position profile. I'm trying to remember what's except I'm trying to remember what exactly upsets me. Um, position profile. Yeah, it's more it's more devious than the position profile. So x versus t, like this. What's the problem with this? Well, there's a velocity. See, basically from here, let me put some numbers on this. Well, no, let's not say that, but let's just say from maybe from t1, t less than t1, there'll be some velocity v. Um, v equals just v or whatever, v1. And then, but t is greater than t1, velocity is zero. What's the problem? What happened at this point? The car did not stop. It hit a brick wall. <laughs> it did not undergo a slow acceleration. It underwent an instant deceleration. And even a brick wall wouldn't do it justice. Like, even slamming into the brick wall would take some time to decelerate. This, this so much energy was applied to this car in such a short period of time. This car has been turned into a plasma. It has ceased to be. It no longer exists. It and everyone in it are not even dust. They're gluons or something. They're just gone. And so um, we're dealing with insane particle accelerator energies or something really weird like that. They're like a quark glu gluon plasma or something really crazy like that. Because, I mean, their velocity, they were going at 60 miles an hour or something. And in a fantastically small amount of time, just tiny nanoseconds, they instantly went to zero velocity. Just instantly. Everyone in that car is dust. But um, maybe I'm reading too much into high school physics problems. But um, anyway, in reality, um, the acceleration, the actual position profile of any realistic system is going to be a smooth line. You can have the acceleration rather instantly decrease, rather instantly change. Say you just take your foot off the accelerator, but even that's not perfect. In reality, every kind of thing is going to be kind of like this. You don't just instantly stop your car. Even if you break your car, even if you hit a brick wall, you don't instantly stop your velocity. You, you, you're going to have a very high acceleration, a very, very, uh, a very, like a very steep, a very high acceleration would be something kind of like that, a very tight curve. But it still is not going to be an instant change in slope. Every time I see a problem with an instant change in slope, I just think everybody involved died horribly. But actually not too horribly, no, because they, no, they, I should say they didn't die horribly because it happened so quickly they couldn't even perceive it. So they were just going down the road one second and then just plasma. Um, so anyway, but again, maybe I'm reading too much into high school physics problems. So with that in mind, let's move on to um, uh, the opposite uh, graphical relationships. And these are the integral relationships, or the area under the curve. So say I have something like this. And I'm going to go the other way. So say I had a system that was A versus time. And then if I knew that, let's say the acceleration in a system is constant. Um, is constant. And let's say I have a T1 and a T2. I'm going to analyze the system from T1 to T2. T1 to T2. And this curve is going to have some area under it. And the area under this curve is not going to be the velocity. It's going to be the change in velocity between those two points. So this comes from the fundamental theorem of calculus. We cannot actually know the value of a graph by taking the integral of the previous one, right? We cannot know the value of the derivative by taking, we cannot know the value of a function exactly by taking the integral of its derivative, right? If you remember from the fundamental theorem of calculus. But what we can do is we can find the change in the, um, in the graph there. So this is going to be basically v2 minus v1, the area here is going to be v2 minus v1, or just the delta v. The area under the acceleration curve will give you the change in velocity. It won't actually give you the velocity, but it will give you the change in velocity. So if I look at a velocity curve, 
something like this. And if this was a constant value, then the velocity is probably increasing linearly. So um, something like this. And you know what, just for fun, I'll have it not start at zero. Just for fun. So this would be v1, and this would be v2. So the area, this would be the area. This would be delta v. This area will give you the change in velocity from t1 to t2. And then we can do the same thing with the area under the velocity curve. And this will not give you the, the position. Again, the area under the velocity curve does not give you the displacement or the position of the function, or sorry, the position of the object. The area under the velocity curve does not give you the position of the object. It gives you the change in the position of the object. It's a very slight distinction, but it's very important. So this then in turn here, the area of this, if this is t1 and t2, this area will be um, x2 minus x1. It will give you a change in position between those two moments in time. So down here then, and if, veloc if the velocity equation is going to be linear, then the position function has to be what? It has to be quadratic. If the velocity equation is linear, if the, if the acceleration is constant, then the velocity is linear. And therefore, at least on that interval, it could be something different past this interval. But then along that interval, if, the, if, along that interval, if velocity is going to be, um, if velocity is going to be uh, linear, then position, xt, this curve has to be quadratic. And I want to show, I want to show that the, um, I want to show that the, the slope is increasing. So this slope should increase. So I'm actually going to draw it not starting with an initial slope of 0, but a slowly increasing slope, something like this. And this then would be, um, let me use something more like that. I'll be taking a break after this, so. This would be x2, this would be x1, and this is again equal to delta x, and this is the change in height here is delta x, and this would be t1 and the corresponding t2. So again, those are the fundamental graphical relationships between um, our quantities here, and, we'll, and then so that will do it for this portion of the lecture, and then we'll move on to curvilinear motion for the second half. All right, we'll take a short break and we'll be back and see you then.